on it all to the circus where it always remains the same but the clowns are what changes <clears throat> welcome to coffee compliance and chuckleheads this is the show for serious healthcare professionals with a lighter spin as always i want to welcome each and every single one of you out there uh, who are streaming live with us on linkedin facebook and youtube and also i want to say a very very good morning to my two partners in entertainment, Eric Rubenstein, who is just Eric Rubenstein, and to our dashing colleague today, our dashing colleague who is in the field, Jordan Johnson. Good morning, guys. Morning, morning. Is that a clip on? It's it cool. is. It is. I love it, man. I'm, I'm going to be some like a clip on tie and you know, all the stuff we made fun of when we were young. And now you like want that stuff. So no, absolutely. You almost That's look awesome. like you got, it almost looks like you got like those thin suspenders, like from the 1930s, like the little rascals. No, I, I think with it's that watch, watch, with that yeah. watch cap and your clip on tie. It's like, Oh my God, look at Spanky from the, Spanky. the little rascals. I was just about to say, I was just about to say we have our very own Spanky. That's it, man. That's what, for the next one. I'm gonna find me the little tiny thin. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna find them. You just need a, you just need Darla, Darla Hood, and you'll be good to go. <laughs> That's funny. That's I funny. It, so man. this morning, I know we haven't talked about it, but this morning in my cup, and I know, I know, uh, Eric has made comments about my um, my plain vanilla and saying that I need to get a little color into things. But uh, this morning, I am drinking my Pete's coffee this morning uh i had some invader coffee very early this morning so i'm a little geeked out and ready to go i hope everybody's doing fine and to all of you who are joining us out there in the uh interwebs welcome to the show um you know today if it's all right i thought i'd kick us off a little bit different um to kind of get us into a little bit of a round table discussion because i thought this was pretty interesting I came across some information that talks about the eight major problems in the United States healthcare uh, system. And this was according to an organization called Medifind. And they basically research leading universities, uh, publish studies conducted by groups like the Commonwealth Fund, uh, Healthcare Quality Access, the HAQ, and others. And basically, <clears throat> According to this group, and to be honest with you, uh, I think they hit most of these square on the head. Uh, they identified, as I said, eight major issues impacting <coughs> healthcare right now outside of the public health emergency, right? So putting COVID-19 aside, these are the ones that they have actually identified. The first one is preventable medical errors. Square on the head. Uh, they that was and, us on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Per, per, so only only eight? Yeah, there, there, there's only eight. Yeah. There's only Prevent, eight. Preventable medical errors. Is that is that are, are they qualifying that from uh, inappropriate diagnoses or uh, the doc who leaves the sponge in the patient's abdomen? Yeah, I think that's, or, that's probably it. I mean, lack of <laughs> lack of communication, basically cross-checking assertions, saying, "Hey, like you said, do an inventory." Somebody sees something, doesn't speak up, accident happens, wrong medication, wrong dose. Somebody saw it. I think that's probably what it sounds like. Yeah. You know, so. This one's interesting, right? Because this was a recent study that was conducted by Johns Hopkins. Yeah, and, I know. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And what they did was they analyzed medical death rate data for eight years and found that medical errors are to blame for more than 250,000 deaths per year in the United States, which accounts for 10% of all U.S. deaths and makes it the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. Wow. The so med mal The med mal lawyers... Did the have the med mal lawyers now put a slide all together now on the on a on a board to be able to make that exhibit one? So that's, a, that's pretty amazing, right? No, it is. is it? And I, I did some research on that study, and I think the most amazing thing is think about it. We have more technology in place than ever before, yet this rate continues to grow and is and is so what it shows me is you can have all the technology you want in place. If you don't have the core fundamentals 
of effective communication. So not just saying something, but making sure somebody heard you or the culture to where people can speak up. That's what this study showed to me um, was because literally we have every fail safe. We have barcode scanners, QR scanners, you name it. We can, you know, and then everybody's, you know, joint commission accredited. They have all these accreditations that are supposed to be for safety and quality at these accidents and rates are higher than they've ever been. Well, what's amazing to me is the fact that the Sharpie pen has become one of the most important tools prior to surgery, right? To, you go have surgery and they come over and the doc asks you, the nurse asks you, what are you having done today? You know, I had, I had hernia surgery a few years ago. <clears throat> they come over and go, what are you having today? So I'm having hernia surgery. Oh, uh, uh, abdominal or inguinal? I'm having inguinal surgery because that's what the doctor told me. He says, left or right, okay. And the nurse comes over and puts a check mark on my right side. Then the doctor comes over. What are you having done today? Well, gee, doc, I, I think you're doing an inguinal surgery, left or right. And then he takes that check mark, circles it, and then writes his name. Before you know it, you've had an entire episode of, you know, uh, three cans of graffiti spray painted, you know, on top of you. Uh, for those of you that, you know, grew up in New York as I do, and you know, graffiti on the trains and the warriors, it was like having the warriors come and tag on your, because that by the time you're done, you've got big old, but it's amazing to me, right? That it's come down to the fact that the Sharpie pen has become one of the most important pieces of, uh, of surgical equipment to make sure that you go home. If you're supposed to go home with both kidneys you're going home with both, or if your right kidney is supposed to be removed, it's not your left kidney that gets removed. Or and we and we laugh. I mean, we giggle a little bit, but this crap still happens, guys. Wrong amputation, wrong limb, wrong site surgeries. I mean, it's crazy that this. I mean, it sounds to to Eric's point. I mean, something as simple as a sharpie, but it it's crazy. What do you guys yeah. think from a from a fraud waste abuse perspective? <clears throat> some doctor does the wrong surgery. And then outside of suing the doctor from the patient's perspective for medical malpractice, what are your thoughts on the, the payer going back and trying to recoup from the doctor and the facility the cost of the procedure as a medically unnecessary service? I don't know Absolutely. if I've ever seen that. I don't know if I've ever seen that, but you know, theoretically, right, that you're, you're getting that money back and then and then someone's got to go and do the right surgery at some point or, yeah. or, you know, or, but I mean, if you had a surgery that was the right surgery, but there was another malpractice piece and then the patient suffers infections or needs follow-up surgeries and all of that. Now those, those follow-up surgeries are clearly going to be medically unnecessary or, you know, a hospital acquired infection that results from poor, poor management of the patient leaving in a, a sponge or, you know, I mean, these terrible things you hear, yeah. um, you know, you could see that you could see an insurer coming back and saying, Hey, uh, we shouldn't have paid for this. Well, I would agree with you. I mean, think about it. You know, a surgical, a surgical procedure was performed on a body area or organ system that was not required. So why should the insurer have to pay for it? I, I absolutely, I, I, I can absolutely see instances where they would want to recoup the money. I guess the question is when one of those adverse actions transpires during a surgery afterwards, if there's litigation for malpractice or whatever it is, who notifies the payer of that surgery, if anybody, because I'm guessing most of the insurance companies never find out that the wrong surgery was performed. Right. That's probably the issue. Now, Quickly moving on, and I don't want to spend too much time on all this stuff, but I think this one's actually really interesting. They listed this as the number two major issue in the United States, and this is poor amenable mortality rates. And what they mean by this is um, that, I don't know if you guys are going to believe this or not, um, but the United States ranked last on the Healthcare Access and Quality Index, the HAQ, in amenable mortality among eight other comparable countries, so eight other first world countries, right? The countries that we fell dead last to, and, and, and it's not even close in some of these cases, the Netherlands, Australia, Sweden, Japan, 
Austria, the comparable country average was 93.7. Then you had Germany, France, the United Kingdom, and then at dead last of the first world countries was the United States. Wow. You know, well, not to make this a political discussion at all, but those are all countries, if we, if we look at them, all those countries, I presume, have some sort of national health care or socialized medicine. So, you know, you can argue about whether or not socialized medicine is good or bad and the taxes that come with it. Um, you know, I know that in Canada, for example, the, the tax rate is inordinately high because of the socialized medicine and you wait forever for things. But, you know, there's an interesting... Um, there's an interesting documentary by Morgan Spurlock. If you remember him, he did 30 days and supersize me. And yes. he does a very interesting documentary where he goes out to it's either Saudi Arabia or uh, UAE, uh, UAE or one of those countries. And he goes to a JCO certified hospital with all U S board licensed physicians. And he goes for like three or five days or something like that. And he gets every, oscopy you can imagine. I mean, he just gets the full soup to nuts physical test. He gets PET scans, endoscopies, colon, he gets everything. He's there for three or five days, uh, nuclear cardiology, all of that. And it rings up a bill and the bill is like, you know, I'm making up a number. It's something like 3000 or $4,000. And he just goes, all these things. And then he goes and he has somebody do an analysis on what the average cost would have been in the U.S. for all of the exact same stuff. And the bill was hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the place that he stayed for the five days or three days he was there was it had like a hotel manager. It was like a it was like a resort hospital that catered to people who would go. I have a, a friend of mine back in New Jersey who is married to a Filipino lady and um, they go every year. They go for a month or six weeks or eight weeks to Manila. Her father was uh, someone in government for years. And so they're a little bit on the higher income scale, but he goes every year and gets all of his physicals and medical tests and whatever else at a facility in Manila and pays cash and says, it's great health care and I pay cash for it. And it costs me about 1500 bucks for all of this stuff or to that, whatever it is. And, you know, my co-pays here and my, all my other stuff, substantially more. It, it always is interesting to me when you hear these kinds of stories about stuff like that. And that's, I have a friend who's, I have a friend who needs a, a hip replacement and the, she's walking with a limp, like half handicapped, like literally with a horrible limp. And the doctor that she went to documented her arthritis as moderate and not severe and her insurance company denied it. And now she's got to go through this whole process of getting a second opinion to get a doctor to say it's severe, but she can't walk for more than, you know, X number of feet without needing to stop and sit because of the arthritis. So it's just interesting to me that they, you know, that they, where we're listed, but then maybe not so much interesting. Yeah. Go ahead, Jordan. What were you going to say? No, I mean, that's the caveat, right? As we approach into this value-based care market that's getting exposed right. is, is the margins and the cost of for these outcomes when people, you know, Mayo tried to do this and Mayo does a lot of this where you can go in, not that Rochester is a resort town, right? Um, up in Minnesota, but people will go in, spend three days, get all their tests, do everything inclusive. But again, the costs are absolutely incredible. And I think that's that's the balance. I mean, so much healthcare, if it was tracked and trended, I feel like goes outside of the U.S. Far more than we think goes outside the U.S. Well, to your point, number five on the list was high costs of care. And, and I'll come back to that. Eric, the number three was lack of transparency, right? And this ties to fraud and cover-ups, which they claim are rampant in the U.S. healthcare system. I can't disagree with that. I think as a former OIG uh, uh, enforcement officer, I think you would agree with that as well. But what they've identified for, for our folks that are out there listening today, a significant problem is the upcoding of services, which becomes a tug of war between providers and insurance providers with policyholders stuck in the middle. Providers upcode a procedure to get more money from insurance companies, but insurance may charge higher premiums to employers and tighten its belt when paying consumers. And it goes on to say healthcare consumers get stuck in the middle without any control over health outcomes and pricing. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, we, we know, and, and you know, you keep up on 
probably every bit of data and regulatory stuff that comes out there from a compliance perspective. And, you know, E&M and, you know, the people that, fo- that are watching us, that listen to us, that follow the blogs I write, that, you know, all of your podcasts, uh, you know, all the stuff that Jordan puts out. We all know that E&M codes are, are just one of the highest areas of error, whether it's through intentional fraud, waste, abuse, or lack of understanding. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the amount of error rate that I've seen has been in, has been upwards of 40%, I think for E&M codes, it's for, and for as long as E&M codes have been used, there have been inordinately high error rates. You know, we've got, um, on the CMS side, we've got things like the PERM and the CERT, which are intended to look at things like error rates nationally um, on whether it be the Medicare side or the Medicaid side and, you know, the, the, the circulation of the 17 states a year on the Medicaid side on a three-year cycle. And the fact that for as long as these audits have been done and these reviews have been done, that the error rates are as high as they are, uh, you know, it just... What needs to change? I mean, obviously, CMS came out with the 2021 guidelines to help to loosen that up and make them less time based and make them more uh, patient centric. But, you know, until there is a tectonic overhaul and shift in the manner in which an office visit is billed. You know, I remember uh, years ago when I was an OIG agent in in New York, uh, there was a there was one payer and I, I can't remember the name of the payer specifically. It was one that that was a, a, a commercial payer uh, in New York, they had um, on their commercial side, two codes that they build that you you could submit to one of two codes. It was like a 99211 or a 99215. Uh, and they had a separate fee schedule. And they just said, you know, if it's, if you're dealing with anybody other than the physician in the office, it's a, a nurse's visit, changing addressing, talking, doing whatever, it's a 99211. If you're meeting with the doctor, it's a 99215. And you're just pay, you're just being paid a flat fee, and I don't remember how they you know determine the the RVUs and all of that because that's inconsequential for our discussion. But and they they essentially just streamlined it and said it's either this or it's that. Yep. And you know, so I pulled up the twenty I pulled up the twenty twenty support to your point, yeah. and it's still running. I mean, every year, like you said, it's still running a 6.3% total inaccuracy rate. And then of that inaccuracy rate, the common causes are insufficient documentation, medical necessity, incorrect coding, with the majority being insufficient documentation. And when you look at the trend year over year, it literally, like you said, has been the pretty much pretty consistent for the past like five, six years. It's been the exact same. So yeah. what needs to shift and change to see this uh, you know, really, really change and have some impact. Well, CMS is part of CMS's uh, metric on this a couple of years ago was they put out um, a request for information and <clears throat> they put out this RFI and they were doing these listening tours where they were going around the country. And I went to one that they had in Philadelphia and they wanted, they were really looking for uh, and continue to look for, from what I hear, some sort of AI platform that can sort of either recode or auto deny on the E and M side. Um, right. Because it's, because it's such a labor intensive, I mean, you know, it, uh, even a really good auditor uh, for E and M's can only do about four to six an hour if they're really good and they can read the documentation. Um, right. c- you know, it takes about 15 minutes to do, an E and M audit to really look and look at the medical decision making and all of that. Even the the best of the best of the auditors need fifteen or twenty minutes to go through that medical record, particularly if it's handwritten. And then you got to read the you know the the chicken scratch that they've got. So uh, you know it's it's we, we're 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 we've created a beast of our own development, right? Oh, we absolutely have. There's no doubt. And, you know, to your point, Eric, you were talking about, you know, healthcare in the UAE as an example, right? So just looking, just taking, and I think, Jordan, you'll be fascinated with this as our numbers guy, right? So just one example, if we were to take a C-section, okay, just a C-section. In the United States, the cost for a C-section is $15,000. 15,000, okay? In the UAE, 
it's four thousand four hundred dollars in south africa it's three thousand two hundred dollars but let's let's go to other areas where people say well compare apples to apples okay um in australia eight thousand four hundred dollars in switzerland where i wouldn't mind having my health care provided seven thousand five hundred united kingdom seven thousand dollars so there's no doubt that the ua it, it, there's no doubt that we rank the highest in the, in the nation and part of what they're claiming drives these escalated costs is new technology but <clears throat> if you look at where we fall with technological advances we still fall behind other nations in our technology okay prescription drugs and diagnostic tests i don't think well, anybody, is, you know, what, what, what's, what's thing about that sean is in, in economic health care uh and it's actually a normal i think it's a, a traditional economic formula but in economic health care they use something called icer which is the incremental cost of, I always forget what the rest of it is, but it's, you know, it's essentially the mathematical calculation of is the new technology, um, is, the incre is the incremental co uh, incremental cost effective ratio. Um, I'd like to thank the professor that taught me that when I was in uh, graduate school for healthcare administration. Uh, that's the only thing I learned, but uh, in incremental cost effective ratio where they look and they say, is the cost of the new technology worth the development of it and is it really that much of a better thing and you see that a lot in the pharmaceutical industry when a patent is coming due and a drug manufacturer comes out with a drug that they would say okay take this one pill twice a day once in the morning once at night and then to extend the patent they come up with the extended release version which is two pills once a day in the morning, it's right. the same pill. They're just giving you that extended release, which gives yeah. them an, a, a, the ability to extend the patent another seven years. That's and right. so, you know, clearly someone has done the ICER calculation because on an extended release drug, all they're really doing is taking existing technology of the coding and this and that. And so, you know, a lot of that cost is like that. Do you need for certain surgical procedures, do you need to have a Da Vinci robot to do that? Or does conventional surgery work just as well? Outcomes are just as good, all of that. You know, probably the same thing in Jordan. You know, I think I'd flip this over to you on, on some of the radiological and, on, and oncological stuff. Does the latest and greatest technology, uh, that does that really equate to better outcomes? No, I mean, that's the big argument that I have right now. And I met with CMS and CMMI last Friday um, to present some of this data about innovation and costing exactly what you said. You know, does a 1.5 Tesla MRI versus a three Tesla MRI, you know, it may cost an extra four, you know, three million dollars. What's the upside to outcome? We see the same thing in cancer care. Um, just because we can do it doesn't mean we necessarily should do it. So if something is you know, five or six times the cost, but the outcome is marginally incremental better. You know, the quick argument is, yeah, but you're going to you're going to stunt innovation. Uh, you know, that's again, I, I, I and we can easily argue that, you know, if if that's the case, then is everybody OK continuing to pay like you said, because the cost is going to end up getting passed on to uh, the patient at some point, And, and it's a it's right. a system to where it's just not a sustainable system. Isn't that uh, the Elon? Isn't that the Elon Musk feeling? Right, like very, the latest, much the greatest so. innovative technology, and the costs. Is, I mean, it's an, it's the you know it's the high tech. That's right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just because you can doesn't mean you should. If it's not affordable and the outcome's not better, I mean, it's great that we could do it, right? Um, I mean, it's great that you can fly up to the what the edge of space with what Bezos and all them are doing. But I mean, how many people are going to stand in line? That, I mean. I, I'm not. I mean, so many people are going. I, I know Jeff, Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos had that 18 year old kid whose daddy paid twenty eight million dollars to send him into space for three minutes. That twenty eight million dollars clearly meant nothing to that family. Yeah. You know, it, it's like they say some people have more money than sense. But, you know, we can we can get into these social, you know, these eco, uh, you know, socioeconomic disparity conversations and. There's no doubt that, you know, the gaps continue to grow. Um, you know, is, is there 
a scientific reason for us to be in outer space? Sure. Is there a military reason for us to be in outer space? Sure. But these, you know, it, it, it's like, to me, I look at it as like, you know, the Disney World trip, right? Tomorrowland or whatever they call it. I mean, what? Star there it is, Star Wars. I mean, I don't know. I mean, again, I'm sure there's some folks who are, you know, uh, you know, outer space experts who can say, you know, these are all the reasons why, you know, we need space exploration. And, 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 and I'm fine with that. I, I get it. But to create these commercialized trips just to spend three minutes in outer space, um, I, I just don't get it when we have so many other significant problems. Put the political crap aside. I'm not even talking about political problems. I'm talking about shortages, right? Shortages and inefficiencies in healthcare. Okay. Um, there was a study done, and, and I think that this was a, a really interesting one. This was done by the Harvard Business Review. And, you know, even though the shortage of nurses and physicians has been something that we've been struggling with now for what, more than a decade, um, Harvard Business Review actually says hiring more doctors does not actually solve the problems. And what they actually are talking about is, according to the Harvard Business Review, the following elements are contributing factors to health consumers' lack of access to just primary care. Uneven care, okay? And I think this is important because when you, when you define what uneven care is, we're talking about health consumers that are receiving different levels of care determined not by a standardized level of quality, but by their location, which we've talked about in the past, their condition, or their insurance plan. And again, we've all been in agreement about the fact that more rural areas uh, don't have enough physicians, while many of the urban areas are oversaturated. So there's an uneven distribution of clinical providers throughout the United States. And Jordan, I know you, you, you see this all the time. Oh, man, we do a ton of this data research. And I think the NR, the National Rural Healthcare Association, the NRHA showed, I mean, we had 153 plus hospital closures since 2010. And I think one of the biggest contributors to that is lack of ability to recruit a physician to a rural area. Um, uh, you know, we can talk about access to care and all that all, uh, all day long. But uh, to your point, at what, where do we fix it? How do we fix it? Because there is that uneven distribution. But the uneven distribution was caused by financial reasons. So we know that there's a higher commercial population in urban areas. The reimbursement's better. When we go out to our rural areas, it is Medicaid, self-pay, and Medicare at best. Okay, so I think as we shift this model to value-based care from fee-for-service, it's exploiting what we've already all known, but the knee-jerk reaction is you can't have the best of both worlds. Either we're going through this correction or we're not. That's right. So That's right. And, you know, look, um, there's a few other things, and then we'll get off this topic because I want to really talk about, Eric, um, you know, the case that you brought up. Um, but these are the other things, right? Lack of insurance coverage, obviously, we get that. We're seeing that more and more because of the number of people that are refusing to re-enter into the workspace for whatever reason. I don't get it. Uh, unemployment benefits have run out in many states or they're now nearing uh, running out. But yet, I mean, everywhere I drive in my city, I mean, you could go a stretch of about a mile and every single business on that street now has signs out that says now hiring. So Paying. I've never seen anything like this. So I'm here in Galveston at our conference and I've taken the time the past few days to ride around and we've been to some restaurants and that's, they have signs on the door saying, you know, service is going to be slow. We have lack of staff. We have yeah. exactly what you're saying. Well, I just saw a sign outside. I was leaving home Depot the other day and there's a McDonald's right out front. And I pointed out to my wife, I said, look at that sign. It says McDonald's now paying daily. They're literally having to get people to come to work by saying, we'll give you your money daily. I mean, I saw one sign that actually said paying cash. <laughs> I'm like, 
unbelievable. I've but, seen that. I've seen that. Yeah. Exactly the same yeah. thing. Cash bonuses for sign up. Yeah. Uh, please excuse the the long waits due to staff shortage. Due to staff shortage, the restaurant will only be open for dinner. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've been we've been seeing that, and then like Chipotle here, Wendy's here. A couple of the people there at the conference said their their teenagers just got their first job and working at Chipotle or working at Wendy's. One girl here, her daughter's working at Wendy's, just got a job for sixteen dollars an hour at Wendy's. Yeah. So if I'm corporate Wendy's, I'm looking at my financials, right? And because all of a sudden, you know, the cost of goods, you're going to have to raise the price of what you're charging or you're shutting down facilities because there's no way you go from paying nine dollars an hour, ten dollars an hour to 16 across right. the board. I just we're in we're in this correction is not just healthcare. Um, it it right. will trickle down to all areas. Well, and forget yeah. forget forget the fact that it, it's it's been a while since I had my first minimum wage job, but my first real job when I was in college was I worked for uh, in the city of Buffalo, New York while I was in college for EMS as an EMT and then as a paramedic. And my starting pay, $4.25. I got paid minimum wage to do CPR on people and, and you know, yeah. got shot at twice and, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, real life medical things as a 20 year old kid. When I left, uh, I think I was making six fifty an hour. Yeah. So you know, I could sling fries for sixteen bucks an hour. There you go. Old, old well, shirts yeah, I mean, the gap, man. That's yeah, a- I mean, I think about this. You know, my very first job when I was when I turned fifteen years old, I was told your butt's getting a job, and you know, I, I went to McDonald's, and that was my very first job. And I think I was making five bucks an hour, five five twenty five an hour, something like that. You know, to see that they're starting people at 16 bucks an hour and you still can't get people to come to work. Um, one one last thing that I wanted to point out, and, and Jordan, I, I really want to get your take on this thing, right? Um, the Harvard Business Review can, you know, points out inefficiencies, right? And what they say is um, increasing transparency is 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 part of what's going to continue to lead to inefficiencies. Um, I call BS on that. And <laughs> no, I also, uh, that's, yeah, that's I, the big yeah, argument. Yeah. And I also call BS on having to delay the implementation, the full implementation of price transparency rules. I call full BS on that. There is absolutely, I think you said it last week, we're talking about a freaking Excel file that gets put up there from uh, a, a hospital. You know, why would you delay something that is only going to ultimately benefit the consumer at the end of the day. I, well, I, I mean, that's a, in our personal households, we have transparency for our checkbooks. Why should, and so I think this is where the argument is, is listen, the biggest struggle right now, and I'll touch on this, I'm doing a webinar on Monday where I'll look at some of the data for some of the CMS alternative payment models that we've modeled. The biggest knee jerk, why people don't want this transparency, um, is it does expose, it exposes the correction that's needed. Well, the only way the correction that can, is needed that can be fixed is, is margin control, meaning margins got to come down, which means some of these big guys, um, you know, the vendors that haven't ha- taken any risk, we've talked about this, now they kind of get their you know feet to the fire that they're going to have to make some tough business decisions. But we've already been making them all along. I mean, we, you know, transparency in the hospitals, you know, we've we've done productivity, we've decreased staff, we've done all this. So to say that transparency, um, you know, is going to make things harder or be more costly, we've already identified that 25 percent of healthcare spend is waste, and of that is administrative uh, burden and duplication. Well, the reason it's there's so much duplication in the burden is we're not transparent. We don't know what all's being done. If we knew what all was being done, we could fix it. Meaning, you know, how many, does everybody need a secretary? Can nobody make their own faxes anymore? I mean, there's all kinds of little stuff that we're looking at. It's like, guys, this is, this is crazy, but you know, there's vested interest for a lot of people to not be transparent. Uh, And I think that's what you see, right? The lobbyist, um, you know, the top, what, 15 lobbyists out of the top 20 are all pharmaceuticals. So when they don't want it and I, I, you know, again, you can't, we can't talk about fixing the problem and not fix the problem. That's right. And, you know, Don, Don Cope, um, you know, who, you know, posted a comment. I agree, you know, and Jordan has said this a number of times, you know, it's all about the legacy, right? 
you know, what do you want your legacy to be? Who knows? Maybe in a future episode, maybe Eric Jordan and I each announce our candidacy for the U.S. House of Representatives or the Senate to represent Mississippi, Georgia, and Florida or New Jersey. I, I got to tell you, man, you know, say what you want about somebody, you know, who we're not going to mention, but, you know, somebody's got to get into D.C. And, and, and they've got to expose the frauds that are taking place there. And, and well, I mean, this is just, primarily why I left hospital administration, right? I was in administration. Yes. You can see every problem and That's they right. give you every reason and roadblock to not fix the problem. That's right. That's right. All right, Eric, let's talk about, let's talk about your case because you brought up, you brought up uh, a really interesting case and it's somehow tied into an investigation that uh, you our award-winning counterpart uh, was involved in. And it was actually a really interesting case that engaged with the Internal Revenue Service, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Office of Inspector General. So talk, talk about that case, man. Yeah, so, you know, I think the, the good prelude is that there was a superseding indictment that just came out. I'm just flipping uh, the press release on for a second so I could look at the datum. August 10th, press release came out on a superseding indictment that occurred in the District of New Jersey, uh, again, on one of these telemarketing frauds. Um, so the spinoff cases since Operation Brace Yourself, which is now uh, probably close to a year and a half or two years in, uh, is, is, you know, all these prosecutions are continuing, people are pleading. And I, I think the, the piece of the puzzle that, that a lot of uh, people that read the press releases don't always understand is they see that there's 20 agencies involved and people sometimes wonder, you know, like why is the OIG involved with, and then there's a, a slew of other agencies. Like why is it the OIG, the FBI, DCIS, Defense Criminal Investigative Service or DODIG, the IRS, why are these state, local? And, and the, the, the real reason is that different agencies are the primary investigators of different things, right? So the IRS is the only agency that can investigate and recommend for prosecution tax-related matters. The FBI does not have that jurisdiction. It's written in statute. The IRS specifically has that. The FBI has um, is not the only agency with the broadest investigative authority. People think that they are, but uh, the marshals have very broad investigative authority. The U.S. Postal Inspectors have very broad investigative authority. And, you know, anything to be charged, almost anything to be charged as a mail fraud or a wire fraud, which would be something that the Postal Inspection Service does. So it's not uncommon to see this, this multi-agency, uh, you know, grouping, particularly when you're dealing with a case that has uh, a lot of people and a lot of money, one agency just sometimes can't handle it by themselves because it's a resource management issue. It's not from a lack of necessarily a jurisdictional ability. It's, it's resource related. And so the, the, the press release that was put out, it's $250 million in telemarketing fraud. The, um, the owner of the company was indicted on a, what they call a superseding indictment. It looks like two of his co-defendants have already pleaded guilty. For people that don't understand what a superseding indictment is, it means that the, uh, the defendant in the case has already been indicted by a grand jury. Um, which is really nothing more than an allegation based upon probable cause to believe that something occurred. And a superseding indictment is that the government continued its investigation. The defendant in this case uh, did not plead guilty. They've, uh, they've chosen to plead not guilty and are currently exercising their uh, constitutional Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. And so as a result of doing that, um, the government continues its investigation and in continuing its investigation uncovers new or more granular evidence on the previous indictment. And in order to charge additional things or new things, you have to present a brand new charging instrument, which is the indictment. For those of you that are watching this, if you're lawyers and I got this wrong, please correct me. Um, but, you know, generally that's the that's the, the way it works. So in this case, this guy got uh, re-indicted, essentially. Um, 
And uh, and that reindictment, you know, included some additional things, but the IRS is involved. And the piece about the IRS that makes it interesting is that in, in a lot of cases, the IRS does not get involved because um, the dollar amounts aren't necessarily substantial enough. So sometimes in kickback cases, you know, the, the IRS's involvement is what would the tax liability be on the value of the kickback that was paid? And is it something that rises to the level of criminal or does it rise up to what they call just a revenue issue where you have a revenue agent who's doing a recalculation of tax? And, and oftentimes in, in kickback cases, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the plea agreement will put a clause in the plea agreement that will require that the defendant uh, w uh, amend their tax returns to reflect the appropriate liability. Because even though a kickback is an illegal remuneration, uh, you still need, oddly enough, you still need to report it on your tax return as income, uh, although no one does, obviously. I mean, it's cash, you know, or, or kind. And so what you oftentimes will have is if someone got fifty or $60,000 in kickbacks in cash, the liability for that fifty or $60,000 may not, is not going to be fifty or 60000 because you're actually paying tax based upon the effective rate of what you should have paid. And so oftentimes... Um, for the IRS criminal investigations uh, side, they need to have, by the way, special approvals when they work cases. They can't just go and open up the case. There has to be approval through what's called DOJ tax, and the case has to be approved. They have to get what's called an expanded grand jury because taxpayer information is not treated the same way uh, as it is other things. Meaning, as an OIG agent, I could go serve a subpoena on an accountant for tax returns for a subject of an investigation because there's no accountant privilege. But if I wanted to get actual tax returns, the official certified copies from the IRS, the U.S. Attorney's Office needs to do what's called an ex parte order to a judge to force the IRS to release that. It's the same thing with Social Security related information. You have to get an order from a court. Even as an agent, you would have to do it. Agencies do not get carte blanche on those things. And I think that's an important point that sometimes people don't realize is that, the, you know, just because I'm a government agency representative doesn't mean that I get access to all of the, you know, pieces of the, of the puzzle. Um, and so IRS will typically get involved when there's obviously large sums of money, $250 million. And the fact that there were shell companies overseas and, and the like will, will, will make that. And then obviously if there's false filings on returns. So I, I worked a number of cases that involved kickbacks uh, in which shell companies were, were created and, and uh, money was being passed on through, we used to call them back in the day, you typically see with MRI centers, you see it now with a lot of the strike force cities, particularly in Brooklyn, the, the doc in the box scheme, where the doctor is really the nominee owner, uh, because in some states that don't allow corporate practice of medicine, you have to have a license under that specialty. So you have a doctor who has a PC and then you have an LLC that's the management company. I had a case years ago with a guy who his kids loved the Garfield comics. And so he had uh, an MRI center and it was, you know, ABC, MRI, PC. And then he would have Garfield billing, LLC or OD billing, which is the characters. In. And those were the those were the real true owners of, of the businesses. And so the IRS gets involved in those kinds of cases because you're setting up these straw companies. There's a money laundering component. Uh, you know, money laundering is typically not charged by itself. You have to have what's right. called a specified, which healthcare is to, to rope that in. So when you look at some of these larger um, healthcare fraud cases that involve kickbacks and shell companies, it's not uncommon to see um, the IRS criminal investigations division. Those are special agents. They go to the same training that I went to. Uh, and then they do their add on, obviously, because they're doing uh, Title 26 cases, which is IRS uh, related stuff for things like uh, tax evasion, misrepresentation on a tax return or filing a false return, um, things like that. And so when you see uh, when you see a press release in which you see the IRS is involved, uh, there's typically some large dollar amount. There's some nuanced part of the case 
uh, in which the IRS had some interest in. They're a very small agency. They're bigger than, than the HHS OIG as far as investigators and agents. Um, but they, they spent a lot of time working on uh, task forces involving money laundering, obviously, uh, a lot of things involving what they call money mules, which are people that are transporting money uh, in and out, which you know gets to this case that I worked uh, that involved a guy who had a, a previous conviction uh, under state Medicaid. He was a New Jersey Medicaid provider, owned an ambulette company. Uh, he was uh, prosecuted by the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit uh, for this Medicaid fraud, went and did some uh, prison time for pumping up uh, mileage bills and tra not transporting people and, and things of that sort and was excluded gets out of jail and uh, buys a, an ambulance company and puts it in his brother's name. And, you know, cause he can't own it himself. And, you know, he's, he's basically doing the same thing. And, you know, while he's committing the fraud, uh, he gets stopped leaving JFK on what they call an outbound inspection. And he fills out this form that, um, that CBP requires. And he tells CBP that he's got something like, you know, nine thousand uh, dollars with him in cash and so they go he's going to the sudan uh they say, let's open up your bags let's do a search and he's got about 110 or one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars in different places hidden and you know his excuses or his story is that there was a flood in the sudan and i'm bringing this money it's not just for me it's for my family and my friends families and you know whatever it's and it's a you know it's over a hundred grand and, you know, when it's a very long, convoluted investigation, we'll put it up uh, when we put up the link so you can see, you know, the story. But, you know, the end result was that uh, he was running this ambulance company. He claimed to only make ten or twelve thousand dollars as a dispatcher. We did some search warrants. Uh, he had about eighty or ninety thousand dollars in a safe deposit box. He claimed, by the way, that it was um, it was refunds from tax returns. Uh, that he had been saving with his uh, wife and children, $80,000 in cash uh, for a guy who spent a few years in jail and then was only making reportedly over $13,000 as a dispatcher. He actually had filed returns where he actually was getting back more money in his tax return from his child credits than he paid in taxes in a particular year. Unbelievable. But he had 80 grand in these, uh, uh, you know, in this, in his, in his safe deposit box. He went to trial actually. And, um, you know, a lot of things came out about the way the fraud was perpetuated. Uh, he was, he was directing the EMTs to put three and four people in the ambulance. Um, we actually had an EMT <laughs> that was cooperating and, uh, our EMT that was cooperating at one point was wearing, uh, a, a recording device, a video recording device. And at one point he sat in the ambulance and he was wearing uh, a covert device and he just was sort of like looking around and the, the ambulance was just, it was full of people. It was almost like a clown car. There must have been four or five people in the ambulance and he had to write up call sheets for each one of them. And he said, you know, look, I'm not going to lie on these call sheets. And so the call sheets all had this, it was the same truck number and the same time on them. And so at one point we had all of these reports that he gave us. And, uh, you know, we do a search warrant, we get the reports and, you know, it had like, you know, Sean Weiss, 10 a.m., Jordan Johnson, 10 a.m., Eric Rubenstein, 10 a.m. And they were and they were all from the same. Um, they were all from it's the like same the party bus. Same truck. Oh, yeah, it was like a clown car. Absolutely <laughs> it, was, it was a clown car. But, you know, he went to trial. Um, interestingly enough, his defense attorney was a criminal defense attorney who focused on tax and really didn't know healthcare and really didn't know, uh, you know, any of these things. And, um, uh, the, the, you know, the trial went about four or five days. I, I had really good prosecutors. It was me an FBI agent and an IRS agent. Um, and what we did was the FBI agent was the, was the trial case agent. So he sat at counsel table and myself and the IRS agent would sit back at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and as things were unfolding during the trial, testimony and cross-examination and arguments, they would text or email us, uh, the case agent would, the FBI agent, myself and the IRS agent, and we had a paralegal that was held back. And so real time, we're doing things. And like, you know, literally one day while on the stand, um, some witness talked about how they were bringing the ambulances 
to a garage for repairs and they never ever got a bill for the repairs or anything like that. And one of the things that we learned was that one of the side deals that the owner of the garage had was because this the bad guy was on parole and needed to show that he had employment and the employment couldn't be at the ambulance company. He had the owner of the garage put him on the payroll. And what he was doing was he was paying for the repairs in cash and paying more than he should have been paying for the repairs. And then the owner of the garage was laundering that money in the form of a paycheck as payroll, as if the guy worked at the garage. Unbelievable. And during the trial, it came out. And this wasn't really something that we knew. I forget how, I forget why we didn't, oh, it was a bank account that we didn't know existed. There was something that didn't show up because there was no W-2, like it wasn't reported. But the guy needed to show his parole officer that he had this employment. And, you know, we just we didn't know about it. But during the trial, we learned about it. And so while this is going on, like literally a witness from the ambulance company who coordinated bringing the trucks for repairs is explaining this, but doesn't know anything about the financial piece. Just knows, hey, we would bring the ambulances to this garage. I never got an invoice. It was always my responsibility to do it. And like real time, myself and the IRS agent go out, we find the guy who owns the garage. Like there's a witness on the stand talking about it. And we're driving from Newark to Passaic, which was very close. And we find this guy and we're interviewing him probably within an hour and a half of the testimony having been made. And you know, the IRS agent was able to ask like all of the questions that I would have never understood. Like, how are you tracking this in your books and records? You're getting the cash. You're writing this guy a check. Are you taking this as an employee deduction? Like some of the questions I would have understood a lot of them, you know, not so much, but you know, it just goes to show you that, you know, you've got to have the right people working with you on investigations. And I say that even now in the world, right with you guys, we the yep. right people have to get involved in in something that you're doing from a fraud based compliance legal litigation data piece you know you don't you don't bring in the wrong people to do the right job you got to have the right people that's one thing that I that I took away from my <clears throat> OIG time was you know you've got to have the right people who understand the questions to ask and understand the things that they're looking at at the time to know you, you can't have a tax lawyer defending you in a criminal healthcare matter. That's right. You, you and, and this, and, and this leads me, this leads me into something that we always discuss, right? You know, which is the importance of having policies and, and, and procedures in place, right? And if you don't have proper policies and procedures in place at the end of the day, they're useless because it doesn't matter who you have defending you. There's no defense. It's inexcusable, right? Because, you know, somebody like yourself may look at this as a former investigator and say, okay, great. So you tried to pull the wool over the eyes of the Office of Inspector General because you have this thousand page corporate compliance program, but you really have not established a culture of compliance. And quickly, this leads me into the case that I want to talk about, if that's all right, for a couple of moments, because I, I think this is something that goes on at a lot of hospitals and a lot of health systems. And folks struggle with figuring out, <clears throat> excuse me, how do I address this? And what I'm talking about is a suspected impaired physician or provider, okay? So there was a case uh, that was recently handed down by the Indiana Court of Appeals, uh, whereby they upheld a lower court's uh, award by the jury of $4.75 million. So <clears throat> real quick, here's what happened. This female physician who's an OBGYN was on call during a weekend. She had patients that were being seen in the hospital who were expected to deliver that weekend. Okay. For whatever reason, the charge nurse opted to engage another physician who just happened to be in the hospital to check, you know, the <clears throat> diameters to check how far along, you know, the patient was uh, as far as crowning. And, you know, what, I'm sure if I'm using the wrong terms, I'll hear it from my wife. Um, but um, long story short, what happened was the charge nurse wound up finally um, 
Um, no, I'm sorry. What happened was the doctor who was asked to engage in these patients' care said, wait a minute, Dr. So-and-so is actually on call this weekend. Why aren't you engaging with her? So this doctor reached out to the on-call physician. The doctor came into the hospital who was on call, and apparently, according to uh, the you know, to, to all the documents that were filed, basically ripped into the charge nurse and said, I'm on call. These are my patients. Why wasn't I notified? Well, apparently it was quite the tongue lashing. Okay. And the charge nurse who was employed by the hospital, 12 hours after engaging with this physician, reported that she smelled alcohol on the breath of the physician. Okay. Well, the, the interesting question that some of you are maybe wondering who are sitting out there listening to us is, why did she wait 12 hours? Well, she waited 12 hours because alcohol is out of your system after 12 hours and you can't detect it after 12 hours. So it was gone. Now, this charge nurse went on and basically said that, you know, the doctor was extremely angry with us on and on and on. Um, the doctor then left the hospital, but the charge nurse testified that she saw nothing unusual or concerning while the physician was examining the patients. Um, but here's where the whole story kind of falls apart. None of the other nurses who were at the desk, who were face to face with the physician in the same proximity of the physician that the charge nurse was indicated that they had smelled alcohol on the breath of this physician. Not one of them. Uh, again, the, the, the problem that they're running into, and this is where I tie the policies and procedures into it. The hospital policy is you report this immediately. You don't wait because it's patient safety. Okay. Well, this individual knew because this is a charge nurse. We're not talking about just your medical assistant or your nursing tech or an RN who's a floater, who's, you know, PRN or whatever, who may not be fully understanding the policies of, of the hospital. We're talking about the charge nurse who has to know what the policies are, has to. Okay. And if he or she doesn't, then the hospital has to be held accountable. The compliance officer has to be accountable for failing in their fiduciary responsibilities to ensure that the staff are properly trained, educated, and that people are complying with the policies. Well, long story short, what happened here, and folks, please listen to me. This is where a lot of folks get confused. Jordan, you're a former hospital administrator. I was a hospital administrator for a period of time against my will. You know, Eric, you're, you're a former investigator for OIG. This is where it becomes so important. You have to know what issues should be sent to human resources versus which issues should have been handled as a peer-to-peer -peer review. And the long story short, the hospital told the doctor that um, ultimately the medical group placed the provider on paid administrative leave. But listen to this. They required her to submit to an assessment by the State Medical Association the assessment led to a request for a third-party evaluation, six weeks of inpatient treatment, and the Medical Association's rigorous five-year alcohol monitoring program, which required random testing and ongoing counseling. The doctor who was accused submitted to this because she was told by the hospital and the physician group that this was a peer review screening, but there was no formal peer review. It went to human resources. And the hospital, um, the hospital and medical group filed unsuccessful motions for summary judgment prior to trial and judgment on the evidence during trial because they didn't want it released. But thank goodness there were judges that were smart enough because the trial court and the court of appeals determined that whether the hospital acted without justification as an element of tortious interference with an employment relationship was a question of fact for the jury.
smart enough to put it into jury's hands. They held that the jury was free to weigh the facts to evaluate justification or lack thereof based on the report not being timely made and that the doctor had not been tested per hospital protocols and that consequently, consequently, the doctor was not offered an opportunity to clear her name. I mean, you know, I could go on and on and on and on about this whole thing. But for me, I think the takeaway message on this is, guys, if you have policies and procedures that are nothing more than a paperweight sitting on a shelf or living in your electronic system, they're garbage. Yep. Eric, what say you, brother? <clears throat> you, no, I'll tell you, whenever we would work on a case <clears throat> and we would have whatever the allegation is, you would look at that allegation and it could on its face, oh my God, this is a violation. This is a, this is a healthcare fraud. It meets this definition. It meets this definition. It meets this definition. Then you go and you do a little bit of research and you find that there is a CMS policy or there was an interpretation or an advisory opinion or something that totally blew it out of the water. And I remember specifically one on incident two, where we had, uh, we had, it was a dermatology group where at, at any one given time, there might've only been two PAs in the office or a PA and an NP, but people that felt that fell into the definition of non-physician practitioner, NPPs, which, you know, as you all know, gives you that 85% reimbursement versus the 100% because then it's not really incident to because there's no supervision in there. And and we were and they were billing it out at 100%. And we were like, oh my God, this wasn't going to be a criminal case, obviously. The service was being rendered. We were like, oh my God, we this is, you know, we, we got this. This is clearly a violation. And somebody at one point, and, and I don't know if the rule has changed because I haven't looked for years, but at some point, I came across a document or we spoke to somebody at CMS where there was this loophole that essentially said one non-physician practitioner could be designated to supervise another non-physician practitioner and that there was potentially this carve out on the incident to with respect to this 85% billing. And I may have gotten some of these facts wrong because it was 20 years ago and there may be some other pieces to the puzzle but essentially, in the facts that were presented to us with respect to the way that this practice was operating, CMS did not back us on what looked like an otherwise clear violation of the incident to rule. And the CMS's incident to people said, oh, no, no, there's this carve out. And under these conditions, it can be done. Now, I don't think that the practice was sophisticated enough to fully know that this is the path that they were taking. It just so happened that by the luck of throwing enough spaghetti on the wall, they managed to get a few strands to stick that would have met what that carve out requirement was. But, you know, if you're going to have a policy or a procedure in place and it's just sitting there and you're not going to enforce it, you've got to have policies and procedures that are a enforceable, uh, B clear and concise uh, and Three, disseminate it to everybody so that it's made available and they can understand it and say, oh, well, I didn't really understand what this rule was. Uh, you know, and those are, I think, where, where those compliance pitfalls, uh, you know, come in constantly. No, and that's what we had talked about. I mean, I think that's the thing. Um, as fast as all this is changing, like you said, is... And I remember as an administrator, everybody, it's the policy of the week, right? But who's really reading the policy? Do they really understand it? How's it applicable? Or is it just a checkbox? Um, and I think that's the that's the disconnect that I see that that a lot of people make when they develop these plans is it's just another checkbox. Yeah. You know, it was really interesting. The other day I had a client say to me when, you know, I presented them with their corporate compliance program that I drafted for the organization, which was completely scaled down. The individual said to me, you've got to be kidding me. This is, there's no way I can comply with this. There's no way our organization can comply with this. This is, this is not for a solo physician's practice or a small physician group. This is for a hospital. And I said, no, actually, this comes from the OIG guidance document from 2000 for physicians in small group or solo practice. And he was just like, you've got to be kidding me. How do I handle this? And, you know, you know, my biggest fear, you know, as I said to him was, look, if you all aren't going to administer this, if you're not going to comply with it, if you're not going to live by what's been drafted in here, obviously 
we can work on this a little bit more. We could scale it back a little bit more, but there's not much room to be able to go with this. If you're not, your best bet is to not go at all with a compliance program. Roll the dice so that if somebody comes in on an investigation, you can say, we don't have policies or procedures because it was too complicated for us to be able to understand. We're trying to make the best effort that we can to act in good faith, to do things the right way. Now, the investigator may look at you and say, you're full of crap. And, you know, they, they may take this thing to the umpteenth level, or you may wind up finding yourself getting pushed into a corporate integrity agreement as part of a, a, a settlement agreement or something like that. But the point is, at the end of the day, I think the three of us all agree on this. You've got to have effective policies and procedures. You have to adhere to them. You have to educate your staff on them. And if you're not, you don't have policies and procedures. Isn't it a little bit like a little pregnant? I mean, if you come up with a half a, if you come up with a half a policy, right? So you come up with a compliance plan and that compliance plan is only half of a plan. There's, there's an argument to make, at least from a criminal side, there's an argument to make that you intended to leave this off because you clearly relied upon, because when you're putting your policy together, you're going to probably put in some language that says that this policy in part relies upon guidance from the OIG's model compliance guidance found on blah, 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 accessed on blah, blah, blah date. And so, you know, an investigator, I'm looking at that, I'm looking at your policy and I'm going to say, well, let's see what that, what's that guidance that you're relying upon say? And you go, hold on a minute. There's this whole thing about self audits it's written right here. It's not in your policy. Did you leave that out intentionally? And so you're trying to say, you know, like I'm, I, I'm only a little pregnant or my ignorance from a criminal perspective, you've got an argument. You've now got to fight about, well, you intended to leave this out. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, well, let's go talk to your compliance officer about what they did and how they yeah. came up with this. And then the other half is going to be that even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't, uh, if it passes the intent muster, then you've still got this reckless disregard argument. You've That's still right. got this new or should have known because the mm -hmm. argument is going to be, well, your compliance officer drafted this. They gave you a document that had a reference and a citation to where they're coming up with this policy. You could have accessed this. So you knew or you should have known that pieces of this were missing. It's a very, very slippery slope, right? I mean, if people yeah. don't want to take advantage of what a compliance officer's role is, um, yeah. you know, you're putting yourself at, at you know, at peril on that. Absolutely. All right. All right. We are running up against our time limits here. So let's move into the Chucklehead of the Week Award. Where are the drumsticks? There they are. All right. So the Chucklehead of the Week goes to... Um, an organization, again, we'll post it because I never like to say their names, but this organization and its physician practice group, as well as the chair of its Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery, who violated the False Claims Act. And more specifically, the complaint alleges that the longtime chair of this department for cardio, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, regularly performed as many as three complex surgical procedures at the same time, and he failed to participate in all of the key and critical portions of his surgeries and forces his patients to endure hours of medically unnecessary anesthesia time as he moved between operating rooms and attended to other patients or matters. I think um, Eric put it best. Bro, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So this this is our Chucklehead Award of the Week. Um, it, it was – this one – this one was a close second to the additional three football players who were just um, charged or who just uh, pled guilty, excuse me, who just pled guilty to uh, one count of submitting false claims uh, for the NFL uh, uh, health care fund. And what's interesting about it is they, cre they created claims – that averaged between 30,000 and 50,000 each. But the problem was they didn't know what they were buying. So they were buying ultrasounds that were used for pregnancy tests. Well, they weren't buying squat. I mean, they weren't <laughs> buying any of the stuff. They were. <laughs> I'm like, they, they man, bought, stick, they, stick they, they, bought 
Yeah. So, they got invoices. all right. Yeah, invoices for the ultrasound. And you know, the crazy part is that one of those three guys, I was reading that article, he, he played football for nine seasons and made almost yep. $50 million. Yeah, Portis. Filed Portis. for bankruptcy. That's it. That's it. All right, folks. This brings us to the conclusion of episode 11 of Coffee Compliance and Chuckleheads. As always, we want to say thank you so much for tuning in and spending your morning with us. Uh, we will be back again next week on behalf of Jordan Johnson, who's down in Galveston, Texas. My good friend, Eric Rubenstein, who I believe you're up in New Jersey. Uh, I'm in Orlando. Be in oh, New you're Jersey in Orlando. Next week. Next yeah, week. I'm like, I'm like Joe Rogan without the COVID. I'm on tour. Ah. <laughs> and then on behalf of myself, Sean Weiss, we want to say thank you again for joining us on Coffee Compliance and Chuckleheads. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, be good to yourself, but more importantly, be good to each other. We'll try to do better next week. Take care. <laughs>